Let's talk a little more about the Heisenberg picture. So we have the definition of a Heisenberg operator in terms of the Schrodinger operators. Where I've suppressed the T0 argument of the time evolution operators because I've assumed that at time T0, the Schrodinger operator and the Heisenberg operator and the Schrodinger states and the Heisenberg states are all the same. And so we're just uh, worrying about the time evolving from that point. We could count that as a definition. In order to calculate this, we would have to calculate the time evolution operator each time, which can be hard, of course. But if we take the derivative of this, then we can get an equation of motion for our Heisenberg operators. And we calculated in the previous lecture what the derivative of the time evolution operator was. It turned out to be just minus i on h bar times the Hamiltonian. So we can do this term immediately. So how do we take the Hermitian conjugate of this to do it over here? Well, we have to get a plus i on h bar from that. The, we have to reverse the order of the operator. So we get a u dagger on the left and we get an h dagger, but the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, so h dagger is just h. So all up we get. And again, we can use the trick that this time evolution operator is unitary, which means that the time evolution operator times its Hermitian conjugate is the identity. And so if we insert that in there, and if we insert that in there, and we can always insert the identity, then we're going to end up with a u dagger h u, and that's just going to be the Heisenberg operator. And we're going to end up with this u dagger a s u, and that's just going to be the Heisenberg operator by definition. And the same thing over here, we're going to end up with this Heisenberg operator and this Hamiltonian being the Heisenberg operator. And of course, this complex number can come out because ordering doesn't matter for the complex numbers. And then finally, we note that we've got something that looks like these operators in this order minus these operators in this order. And this is more normally written in terms of the commutator. Now, typically, this second term here is zero because normally our, the operators we consider don't explicitly depend on time in the Schrodinger picture. So, for example, we're usually used to things like momentum or position or the Hamiltonian and so forth, and they're all usually static. And so this term is usually zero. And so this commutator term is the most important term. Now, when we write the Hamiltonian in the Heisenberg picture, it's actually very simple because it just looks like the Hamiltonian in any other picture, in the Schrodinger picture, with all the labels changed. So supposing we started with a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. So we know this Hamiltonian is the correct Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator in the Schrodinger picture. But if we want to turn this into the Heisenberg picture, we just put a u dagger and a u on either side there. And we know that we can then insert them in the middle between these two p's and in the middle between these two x's. And so all I have to do is add a little h to my Hamiltonian, a little h to my p's, a little h to my x's. And indeed, in general, all you have to do is relabel your operators. So that's our Hamiltonian. And so now supposing we wanted to work out how the position and momentum operators evolved in time. Let's do that as an example. And the explicit term here is 0. And again, the explicit term is 0. So now we can just continue on. We know that the commutator is linear, and we know that the commutator of a sum of two terms is the commutator with each term added together. Now, the commutator of xh with xh squared is 0 because they commute. That's just x cubed minus x cubed. So we've just got this term left. And similarly, the term where we have the commutator of ph and ph squared is 0 because it's just ph cubed minus ph cubed. So we just have the other term. Furthermore, we can take out any complex numbers from either side of the commutator. Okay, at this point, resist the temptation to expand this out, because expanding out the commutators won't help you. We actually know what the commutator of x and p is very clearly. The commutator of x and p is just i h bar, but we've got squareds here. So how do we do that? There's a little trick I want to teach you, which is this. This is a very useful trick. You can show that this is true simply by expanding it out. And the, the, you get four terms here, but two of them cancel. But you'll note that there's a good mnemonic. All you have to do is you know you have to get these two apart somehow. So you always take the C out to the right because it's on the right. And you always take the B out to the left because it's on the left. And we have an equivalent version for the product being on the left-hand side, which works exactly the same way. You take the A out to the left because it's on the left. And you take the B out to the right because it's on the right. Okay, if we apply that back up here, 
then what we end up with is that and on the other side and we'll note that this is just the same term twice because xp the commutator of x and p is just i h bar the i h bar cancels with the minus i h bar there and so this is all just we got two of them so we cancel the two and over here px is minus ih bar so we're going to get a minus sign and if we look at those two results the derivative of the x operator that looks exactly like the classical equation of motion and the derivative of the p operator that again looks exactly like the classical equation of motion and this is why Heisenberg was naturally led towards looking at the evolution of operators because it has a really strong correspondence to classical physics.